Welcome, LA Progressive friends and family. Today, I'm sitting down with Jill Haley. And Jill and I have a story to tell you. She gave me a call. I don't know, Jill, what was that? About four months ago, three months ago, the first time you reached out to me? Yeah, I think it was um, the beginning of May. Um, ju yeah, just about the beginning of May. So now we're at the end of July. So yeah, yeah it's been almost two months. Almost three months. So I'm going to uh, allow Jill to introduce herself and to tell you guys why she called me and then what resulted from that phone call. Jill. So my, so my name is Jill Haley. Um, I am the assistant hair and makeup supervisor at the American Ballet Theater here in New York City. And I've been with the company about 10 years now. And um, after the murder of George Floyd in 2020, we um, band together and started a DEI group um, that had kind of been in the works a little bit actually before that, but we, um, we really got underway and I've been in that group ever since. And I've recently um, become a co-leader of a group called the Legacy Committee. And the Legacy Committee um, set out to figure out ways to reflect and honor um, our past as an institution and through the through a DEI lens. And so in jotting down ideas, um, I had had the idea to celebrate and honor Leopold Allen, the first resident hair and makeup artist at ABT. Um, and so I just jotted it down quickly and I was like, you know, I had heard his name so many times, my boss and I so many times over the years. And um, and I, I knew that he had had a significant impact on the, the community. And I knew through um, conversations and discussions that he had sadly lost his life to AIDS. And I knew that also others in the company had as well. And to me, it felt like the perfect opportunity for my career and my um and my passion for DEI to kind of come to together and figure out a way to celebrate and honor both of those things so um i jotted the idea down and in a meeting um with our group we went through them and one of my co-leaders who is also on the marketing team knew that there was going to be a pride evening at abt during the month of june to um during our week of wolf works which um we which honored and celebrates virginia wolf who was such a um such a leader in her time for celebrating um, LGBTQ, the community, and and so before her time, truly. And so anyway, all of these things came to a head when I was like, oh my goodness, I found this article and it's written by Leopold's niece. And there on the screen is a picture of Leopold and Alessandra Ferry who just so happened to be performing with us during this Wolfworks show. So it all really came together in this like organic, beautiful, kismet way. Um, so yeah, then I was like, I have to get in touch with the Sharon Kyle. I have to get in touch with Leopold's niece and figure out like how, you know, we can include his family in this. Awesome. And um, needless to say, I was completely blown away when I got the phone call from you because, um, you know, my uncle died in 1989. So it's been many, many years. And it just shocked me that uh, the American Valley Theater was even still thinking of him. And then to learn that a whole new generation of people are working at ABT and he's still comes up in conversation and he's still revered. And I don't know if, if you, Jill, if you were born yet, even 
you know, at the time that he passed away. So it was just so surprising to me that, you know, of course, he had a huge impact on my life and on the rest of the family's life. And then I, I shared a little bit and I have shared a little bit with the LA Progressive community that um, I was raised by both parents, but my uncle lived with us um, from the time I was four years old until I was 18. So, and I'm the oldest. So I was really very, very close to him and all the major things that happened in my life he shared with me, you know, me graduating or having a baby or getting married. Um, he was just, um, and in fact, my first child, I named my first child after him. So to hear that ABT was still <laughs> just amazing. Yeah. And then, and then we took it from there. So, so we want to share with, you know, what was done after this conversation what did we turn it into? Yeah. And quickly before you do that, it's funny that you say that and mention like, were, were you even born yet? Because what is really also quite kismet and crazy in all of this was finding out. So I was actually born five days before Leopold passed away. And I was born on October 22nd. 1989 and he died October 27th of 1989 and there's just something so weird and cool and I don't know full circle about that because you know they always say that like with death comes new life and like to you know just I was born in Memphis Tennessee to a totally unassuming family who was not really in the arts, um, very, you know, working class and somehow ended up in New York City <laughs> and, you know, and in this institution and the the fact that that he that I was born and then he left this earth within a five day span is just like really wild to me. So <laughs> and, and um, also the fact that you work at ABT, yes, not as a dancer, but right, right, right. In the same in the same right. field, right, right, absolutely, like truly a predecessor um, of his. So yeah, it all felt very full circle and and incredible. Um, so I mean, it's been an honor for myself and everyone else, included my co leader Bethany Beecham who was such a, I mean, extraordinary help along with everyone else in, on our team. Um, Rena, my uh, supervisor here, who is truly Le Leopold's um, predecessor in that position. Um, our um, other leaders within the DEI group at ABT. And then of course, Susan Jaffe, who is the artistic director who really, who worked directly with Leopold, knew him well. And the moment that we said we want to do this, she was immediately on board and, and over the moon about it. So, you know, obviously I couldn't have done it myself. I had so much help um, in the process, but it was such an honor to be able to do it. And we received so much incredible feedback um, but to, back to your question of what what really came of this. So um, I spent myself and others spent about a month um, contacting and interviewing former dancers and people who knew Leopold, including, you know, your, yourself. And I um, and I kind of compiled all of that and. The original idea was to be able to showcase his work and life at the Metropolitan Opera House in New York City during our five-week um, summer season. And we reached out to the Met Opera, and they were so excited about this idea that they actually offered us their display case to use Um for the entire season, which was extraordinarily kind of them. So we got to work pretty quickly on creating this beautiful display um, that 
showcased a lot of images. We worked with um, a former photographer, Paul B. Good, who um, definitely took some incredible images of your uncle that were on the board. Um, we got beautiful quotes from so many of his colleagues and the people that he worked with um, that really just showcased how loved and appreciated he was and what an integral part of these dancers lives who were bringing art to the world um, how important he was to them so that was the board with um, a nice little short bio um, we also were able to display um, very beautiful and sentimental items and books um, some of the books that he was featured in, um, some of the memorabilia that you have from his life, his touring jacket from his Barishnikov and Friends um, tours, and a Barishnikov signed Romeo mask. So, so many really special items. And what's so funny is we got to the Met and we were loading this all in and setting up the display case with the Mets archivist team. And we were like, we don't have enough space for everything. So they graciously offered us a secondary case to put the jacket um, and his the board that the dancers made when he was sick. And we put that into a secondary case. Um, so throughout the entire five weeks, that was open to all the ticket holders. Um, we heard so many amazing stories of how um, people would gather because the press lounge was right across the hall from this. So there were people who worked on the project that were kind of around the area and they would see people by the case talking and reminiscing. I think it was opening night at the Met and there was a big group of people telling stories about him and and saying how wonderful it was. And that felt so good to know that there were, you know, people that knew him getting to see it. Um, and then that led into our Pride Night, which the case was, um, the case was up. And he was mentioned, his name was mentioned in the opening speech. Um that was given by one of our dancers that is in the LGBTQ plus um, community. And then also inside and the insert, the pride insert, um, uh, he was mentioned. And so, yeah, so that was the Met Opera component. And then the component that you got to be, a, you and your family got to be a part of was honoring him at our 890 Broadway studios um, where he, you know, worked and, and was at a lot and hanging a photo of him working on Alessandra Ferry, um, who we got to have with us that evening to speak. So that was, I mean, the feedback that we received from that was just extraordinary. So many dancers, so many people that were so blown away by just the authenticity and the beauty of like celebrating someone that was so deserving and clearly so loved and getting to meet you and your family and share and you all to share your stories. Um it was really special. So those were the elements that we um, that we had um, in honoring him. That's so wonderful. You know um, what? Of course, this is this whole process was very very special. But what makes it even more special is that this was done by a group of people who are trying to honor DEI. So diversity, equity, inclusion. I think that diversity, equity, inclusion was so. Um, it bled through the entire thing, uh, whether we're talking about the display case at the Met or what we did at ABT Studios. What you saw was a community of people that were brought together regardless of gender, identify of sexual identification, regardless of race, regardless of age, regardless of all of the different hierarchies that we put ourselves in as human beings. What we saw is that we all come together in love 
if we give ourselves the opportunity to do that. And I just wanted to thank you, Jill, for giving me that call uh, on that day in May and helping me to have more wonderful memories um, of my uncle and, and especially of his time with ABT, who he really considered his second family. Absolutely. I also thank you. It was such an honor to do and be a part of um, and just felt so, so much warmth and so much love from your family and you know, obviously, you all are an extension of him and, um, and getting to know you made me feel like I, you know, knew him like I, I had like a piece of him. Um, and I know the entire ABT community um, that was involved and those who maybe weren't involved but got to witness it um, felt so much admiration. And I think everyone's excited to continue things of this nature um, and being able to celebrate the past while paving a, a better path forward. Um, so yeah, it was just really a big honor. Great. So do you mind me asking what made you get involved with DEI from the beginning? I, I always so, ask this. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, well, I mean, I think that in so many ways, like ever, even just starting joining this institution, well, actually backing up even further, growing up in a place like Mississippi, where I grew up, and being in such a conservative area and then being introduced into the arts and into theater in general, um, I feel like I went through on such a journey at that young age of like really starting to understand that the world is is not equitable. The world is there is complex and beautiful, but but so many flaws. Like you just start to see the world differently, and I think that that really like lit a fire in me of like wanting to figure out how I can just in some ways like make the world a better place or um or help people that are marginalized have a better path forward. So I think theater and my background really helped lay, I guess, like the foundation and the bedrock. And I, um, and then once I came to ABT, I also like, by nature, I'm a perfectionist. And I always am looking for ways to make things better. Like, how can we make things better, not just for myself, but everyone around me. And um, so I think that getting to know the dancers, getting to know um, them personally, because you work with them all the time. And when you're a hair and makeup artist, which, you know, people actually spoke to about your uncle of like, in some ways, you're kind of like a therapist, a confidant, so many things. So we, we develop these relationships and you hear stories and you know that, that these people around you, especially, I mean, even our, our, all of our dancers go through so much, but our black and brown dancers go through so much. And I, so, you know, over the years, hearing stories and different things. And then after the, after the murder of George Floyd, we were, we weren't working because it was the pandemic and we all came together and we were like, what can we do? And I, I think that that moment and knowing like these people, like, especially because we were, were we were figuring out how can we be better at DEI at ABT. And I just felt so drawn to figuring out how to do that. Um, and it was such a, a camaraderie thing. I think when we first started, the group had over 40 people. 
um, that were pretty active. And yeah, so that was, that was really how I got in started at ABT specifically was I think just my connections to our dancers and caring a lot about how to help our black and brown dancers have a more equitable workspace. Um, and, you know, my boss, Rena and I were dear friends and we've worked so hard over the last 10 years to make sure that our space at AB, ABT Hair and Makeup is more equitable and more that we have more that we're listening to what our black and brown dancers need. Um, but also, I mean, DEI at large, obviously that's not just, but I think at that moment in time, that was really our focus was how can we, because obviously ballet, classical ballet is not, it, it, it the roots of that are not equitable. So um, yeah, so that was where, that was really where it all got started. And then as we dove deeper into what DEI really means, because the diversity part gets highlighted often as it should, but the equity and inclusion part is so much more all encompassing. And that really, that's where the passion grew even further. Like, how can we make sure that all of the sh paths and the streams uh, flowing into ABT are not just diverse, but equitable and inclusive for everyone. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for doing that. And thanks for doing what you do. And I um, wish you continued success at ABT um, and look forward to seeing you again. I'm sure we I will. At some yes. Point. Yes. And ABT, we luckily perform our Nutcracker season every year in California. In California. Um, That's right. So, so we'll definitely be close to you then. And we also um, are often there in the springtime as well. Um, we, that's one thing that's really nice about, um, we have a connection to the Seagerstrom Center out there. So we're often there setting up new shows and we do our nutcrackers. So hopefully we will be able to see each other soon. Absolutely. We will definitely stay in touch. Well, Jill yeah. Haley. I'm so happy you made that phone call and our family is so grateful to the work that you did in honoring my uncle and that the rest of the team did. And just thank you. So yes, thank you. Thanks so much. Time. So long. Yes. <laughs>